many of them stuck on in-work benefits, some of the multinational corporations not even paying corporation tax themselves. It's a very nice way of generating profit while turning Britain into a low productivity economy. Oh. But what it's not is fair on the public realm. It actually makes the deficit bigger and not smaller. So okay. we're standing up for, for the national interest of ordinary taxpayers. Quick reaction, Stuart Hosey, to if that? If the answer in terms of minimum wage or living wage it should be to increase the minimum wage to a sensible amount and more encouragement to pay That's the living wage. It isn't. The answer isn't to demonise people who come from another country. And once again, there's we're an not absence of economic people. policy and we're straight back to people from overseas are bad. It's not the answer to the problems that you've even identified yourself. All right, we Wait. need to move on. Uh, Chris Leslie, I want to come back to you. The Institute for Fiscal Studies, it says, and I quote, literally... Literally, we would not know what we were voting for if we were going to vote for Labour. There goes your financial credibility. No, I think what they were commenting on was our fiscal rule where we say that we want to get the current budget into the surplus as soon as possible in the next parliament. And the reason we say as soon as possible is that plucking an arbitrary date from thin air, as the Conservatives did in this parliament, doesn't work. In fact, you get all sorts of perverse distortions in the way that your public spending uh, plans go. And we know that it doesn't work because we've got 200 billion more borrowing than he said we would have at the beginning uh, of this parliament. So. Our view, because a lot of the uh, improvements in public finances rests also on improved living standards, tackling the low-wage economy, is that we have to make sure we focus relentlessly on living standards because that, combined with fairer taxes uh, for, for the richest and uh, prudent spending reductions, is the best combination, that three-pronged approach. But just look, you keep on claiming that you will balance the books. Throughout this election campaign, Labour politicians have said, we're going to balance the books. Yes. But you know that's not true. You're only going to balance a part of the books, and you're going to continue to borrow under another part of the books. And under Labour, you will still be adding to the stock of national debt in five years' time, and it's already 1.5 trillion. Well, we've had this conversation on a number of other occasions yeah, I still on, on this so program. Give me an answer now. And, and the distinction is this: Look, um, it, having a balance on the current budget is not the limit of our ambitions. We believe that we could get a surplus even on our current budget, and of course that would help deal with the, the capital question. But you would still be borrowing. Gonna, but listen, I'm not going to make any apologies for making a distinction between day-to-day -day spending, which is the one the markets and others are concerned about, and productive public investment, because capital is very important that we get the infrastructure improvements. Yeah, but in is it economy? sensible when we've already got 1.5 trillion of debt to carry on borrowing in another in five years' time, you will still be borrowing. As I say, correct. As I say, it is not the limit of our ambitions to have the current budget solely into balance. But you balance. could still be borrowing. I hope that we will move into surplus and we can get absolutely the national debt falling as a percentage of GDP no, that's within, within, within this next so coming what, parliament. That the is wrong, our commitment. The rest, the rest, cast what's iron wrong, on the front David page of our that. manifesto. What's wrong with borrowing for investment? Well, it was the approach that the last Labour government took, which ran into the crash with the highest structural deficit of uh, any there was major a economy. Crisis, yeah, and Don't we, and we, were, and we were ill here. prepared for it because <laughs> we were following you know, golden rules that didn't really uh, bind the Labour Party at all. You we were, we were, all we were spending too you much money. Did you back we them? were spending too much money. And, and the, oh, the, that's we were, not what George Osborne we, said. We, 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 he backed we every were single one of those too much money. Well, some of us have, the banking we've, crisis. We've learned the lesson from that. You've got to be better. The prepared. Chancellor was wrong. Look, we've been clear that, you know, we fought the two, 2001, 2005 and 2010 general elections saying on every occasion the Labour Party was spending too much That's money. That's not what the we Chancellor was saying. We had to bring saying. borrowing down. Uh, look, and you're making and exactly the same mistake, Chris, David, with the greatest that you respect. made last time. No, with the and the problem respect. is, that, you know, you, you talk about we're going to balance the books, but when you say you're balancing the books, you're still borrowing. And, and that's, that's, that's simply not fair on the electorate now, you, you and it's think. taking a risk. No, you it's taking think, a risk with think. the public you, finance. You wouldn't believe. think, would you, pa Patrick think, would you that the parties of these three gentlemen to my right have stuck a trillion pounds on the British national debt. I think Chris's party managed 400 million, these two guys, 400 billion, these two guys shared 600 billion, and they're all battling to appear to be, to wear the mantle of fiscal rectitude. Mm -hmm. None of them are earmarking big spending programmes that will be cut, but UKIP pa 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 is. Pa Patrick, to be, to, be, to be fair, I think UKIP spokesmen have spent the overseas uh, development no, budget we haven't. 15 times. That's and not the what the CEBR says. Where e is your and independent and the, and the EU budget? 
12 times. That's All right, nonsense. Let me bring in, but that's written let me bring by a in Robert Peston. in your research department. Robert Peston, that has been true. Most economists have been concerned for donkey's years that as a nation we are simply not investing enough. Uh, we've got a lamentable recent record of productivity. It's one of the reasons that living standards haven't been rising in the way that most people would like. Are you basically saying, you know, we just don't need the investment that, I should say, most in, uh, economists of left and right would say is absolutely essential? No, I'm not saying that. And, and if we want to drive up productivity, if we want to increase investment here, then we've got to have pro-business policies. That means having a, a, a tax regime that attracts investment here, and we've cut corporation tax... But investment is not just uh, private sector uh, investment. It is also public sector investment. One of the criticisms that, as I say, economists of left and right made of your government is that in the early years of this parliament, when you could have been cutting current spending and getting the current budget faster into balance, you were cutting really important investment that damaged the productivity well, of the country the and I, damaged jobs. The, the point I was about to make, I agree, it's not just private investment, although private investment is really important. Uh, but, for example, we've set out an infrastructure plan that means that we're going to be investing more in our railways than any time since the Victorian era. We've got a big road building plan. I'm, I'm sorry to hear infrastructure that... Infrastructure is sorry, down I'm sorry when, to, when you took I, office. Uh, I'm sorry to hear that the Labour Party have abandoned two road building programmes one in the southwest and one in the south of England uh, already. You've I think that's a sign. Delayed, I think but that's you criticise us for right, making tough to choices. Come. We but, do have to make but, some tough but choices. But actually, the, the difference here isn't between uh, how much we would. This isn't a difference between Labour and Conservative on the amount of infrastructure, infrastructure spending. It, it's about the Labour Party wanting to have that wriggle room to borrow an additional thirty billion pounds a year by the end of the Parliament after ten years, eleven years of economic growth, still okay. be borrowing, and that's what Labour are about. All right, let me move. Let, let me move on to Stuart Hosey. Uh, all of your fiscal arguments during the referendum campaign were based on the price of oil being around $113 a barrel and rising. It's now half of that. I mean, it's just as well you lost the referendum, isn't it? Because you'd be heading for a, an independent Scotland in the midst of a massive fiscal crisis now. Uh, no. Uh, the, uh, we're very pleased today that uh, the new forecast from the IFS actually see the Scottish deficit half by the end of this parliament. They're Finally, I think, looking at the £15 bill of, billion of forecast additional onshore revenues by the end of this year. Now, you're right about $113 a barrel. Uh, we got that wrong. It wasn't rising, Andrew. We used $113 a barrel fixed. And as we've had the discussion before, the UK government had a higher figure. Even last year, the UK government were forecasting $127 a barrel by the time we got to 2018-19. Yeah, I think the point... But, but the making, difference is, for the UK it, government, oil revenue revenues are a small percentage of overall revenues. For you, they were crucial to your fiscal plans. You were projecting oil revenues of 7 billion for 1617. The real figure will be 600 million. You're up by over 90 percent. And of course, you can say everybody got the price of oil wrong, but your calculations depended on high, high oil prices. Not only that, you denigrated anybody who said they might not stay high. For example, when the OBR forecast oil would drop below $100 in March 2013, Alex Salmon dismissed this as, quote, stuff and nonsense. And it wasn't, was it? Well, nobody expected the price to soften the way it did, although, Andrew, I'm sure you'll want to be the first to agree that given it dropped to $45 a barrel, which was very low and difficult for the UK as well as Scotland, uh, today it's up at $62 a but barrel. you can't base the finances of a nation Indeed. on oil prices over which you have no control. And Indeed. you accuse, uh, Salmond accused the OBR when it even dared to suggest that oil prices may fall well, below $100 of, quote, political manipulation, the way Chris Leslie I, I th has accused I the think, HMRC. I think the thing is, Would you like to apologise for that now? Take I, it back. I think the thing is, everyone got the oil price wrong. There's no question about that. None at all. But you're wrong. We never predicated... No, you were wrong. No, you got the predictions wrong. You're wrong, wrong in your assessment, Andrew. Nobody ever, ever predicated a Scottish constitutional change on the price of oil, perhaps on the control of a resource that's given the UK government £325 <laughs> billion of revenue, why, but not on the price of oil. Scotland can't cope in the way can't cope in the same way as the United Kingdom with those variations. A United Kingdom 
brought together, we can cope with well, that. David, that that's, the, that's the challenge. It's, it's, it's not the prediction. It's certainly the case that we can't cope if we don't have the tax levers and tools. They're sitting in Westminster. And if one looks You've at the Scottish it, fiscal yeah, position you, now, you, you it's, not, a, you it's, not, a, it's not a picture we could, of we could, Scotland I got a question. Let, let me hear from a picture of George Osborne. Chris Leslie. I've got a question for you here because this is why we disagree so profoundly. Nicola Sturgeon has said that she would vote next year for full fiscal autonomy, £7.6 billion of cuts or tax rises. Why are you campaigning for such a massive hit to the taxpayer or to public services in well, Scotland she, in that way? She has never said she'd vote for £7.6 billion of cuts. And it, problem, next year, full the, fiscal the autonomy? Pro the problem, Chris is that we're not going to have full fiscal autonomy next year. And the 7.6 billion figure, which has been positive, is for this year. It's not with full fiscal autonomy, and it reflects UK control of the Scottish economy, I just not what would happen when Scotland has control of the but, tax. But, 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 but Stuart Howes, you, 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 you said earlier that you thought the IFS were coming around to your position, but in fact the IFS said yesterday that in the course of this Parliament it expects that hole in Scotland's finances under fiscal autonomy to rise to nearer £10 sure. billion. Mm. Pounds. So the IFS are saying that you have a problem with fiscal autonomy, that you simply don't have the revenue-raising capacity. Well, what, what the IFS have said most recently is that the deficit in Scotland would half by the end of this Parliament. We're very pleased about that. And, of course, that £15 billion of extra forecast onshore but revenue is, in fact, five times the expected shortfall in the oil revenues. But that's because and the overall British deficit's going down. That's, it takes into account the fact that the overall British deficit on OBR projections goes to zero. Scotland is, 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 part, is part of that. You want to reverse that and the fact no, is with, with the size of it it's why you're so half-hearted about full fiscal autonomy you kick it into touch you say it'll be years here and there you were going to move to independence if you'd won in september in 18 months but full fiscal autonomy is going to take an unspecified number of years and i would suggest to you that's because there's a huge black hole of between seven and ten billion and you would be the party of austerity if you ever inherited that. You would have to slash public spending and raise taxes. Well, I'm sure that's the kind of fears and smears our political opponents What's use. What's the answer to the but question? Term, well, the answer to the question is the 18-month timescale to independence was after the referendum. Yeah. We haven't even had an election, let alone legislation on full fiscal autonomy. Of course yeah. you can't do that in a few months, Andrew. I'm These not saying you do it in a few months, but time. I want to know why you could manage to get to independence in 18 months, but it will take you years to get to full fiscal autonomy. That Why? Was, that was 18 months after the referendum. Yeah. It took three years to have the referendum with all of the necessary <laughs> legislative changes. Well, can I, can I That's just, just a, common pa sense. Can I make a small interjection on behalf of the millions of English and Welsh taxpayers who perhaps want a party that's not battling to persuade Scotland to take more than its fair share of, uh, of public spending? I mean, our plan's envisaged by the fifth year of Parliament spending less than 5.5 billion less. So we're, we're a bit modest by the 7.6 billion well, figure. That Tory Chris cuts. is determined You've always to, to overspend in Scotland. Well, I think many English taxpayers will look at you, Chris, and think that's tail wagging the dog. Chris, I just think... yeah, let, let me uh, move on. I want to, to bring in uh, Dick Newby again here. Now, the, the Lib Dems have dined out on raising the personal allowance threshold. It's the kind of signature policy that you've had in, in this, and, you, uh, and the Tories are even trying to take credit for that as well, even though you claim that it's yours and you claim correctly. But it costs billions. And isn't the fact is that most of the benefit doesn't go to the poor. Of course, it helps the poor. But most of the benefit goes to those on middling incomes. That under the guise of helping the poor, you've actually been giving tax cuts to middle Britain. Well, we've been giving tax cuts to most people uh, in earnings. And that is, a, at the time of austerity, has been a positive thing. And one of the reasons why for households in this parliament, the austerity and the fall in uh, real wages in many cases uh, hasn't been as harsh as it otherwise would be, is because but people in incomes have seen they're paying less income tax. Uh, and that has been a, a positive development in this parliament. We want to take it further into the next parliament so that people on modest incomes are paying no income tax at all. But if you really wanted to help the poor, you would raise the national insurance threshold because that clicks in at around uh, £6,000. And that's not a lot of money. If you really wanted to help them, that's what you would do, but you don't. Well, if we really Why? wanted... To, well, raising the income tax threshold did help those people. But uh, it doesn't, any, it income, doesn't for, no, the, for, but, the, for, uh, the, for the poorest earners, it doesn't anymore. But they're paying national insurance the moment they get 
to around £7,000. They are paying national insurance, but what we want to do is to take what's been an, an extremely effective way of reducing the tax burden on most families in the UK somewhat further so that tax burden is reduced further. The problem, with the, the problem with the personal allowance is you're great one step forward on personal allowance, but of course they give a little bit with one hand and they take away so much more with the other. The VAT increase that you... The VAT uh, and the Conservatives, increase just that let me finish the point. Don't, just, just let me finish the point. The VAT increase that you voted for and you put through, you specifically campaigned